So here we are again on County Live. We haven't been together for a week. This is exciting for for a while actually. It's, uh, this is exciting. Been week. It's been longer than a week. A lot has happened. A lot has happened in football. A lot has happened to Stockport County. But in the meantime, while all that was happening, you spoke to Tom Bennett. Tom Bennett, who of course could make a great case for his partnership with Chris Marsden being the best midfield that County have ever had. Yes. I mean, you're a Liverpool fan, think Steven Gerrard, Xabi Alonso. That's yeah. that's the only way I can that's the only way I can describe it. Um, you know, those two very, very good players next to each other. Um, very cool fella. He's in a band now as well with, with Roger Wilde. So he's got a lot to say, but at the same time, from a football perspective, he's certainly here on merit. Absolutely. So let's not waste any time. Here is Chris's interview with Tom Bennett. And all being well, there we are, Tom Bennett. Very good evening, sir. Welcome to Stockport County Live. How are you doing, young man? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's um, We just had a very, very quick catch-up off air. It's been a bit of a crazy time lately, uh, last few months, the the whole corona situation. How have you, uh, how have you been managing? Yeah, well, it's been difficult. I think we've done okay. Work-wise, uh, for five months, I was furloughed, so... Back at work last week, and hopefully business picks up and everybody's safe, and we get back to normality or whatever's going to be normality over the next probably six months to a year, I would imagine, before we get back to anything like before. I would have thought. And what is it? What is it that you do nowadays? What What is work for you? So I'm a commercial account manager for office furniture, which basically means I'm pretty much an area sales manager but I look after certain accounts so I travel UK Europe looking after you know Jaguar Land Rover HSBC Unilever various different accounts that we supply furniture to um office furniture yeah that's pretty much sums it up nothing you've nothing been on fair fun. Fun. yeah nothing fun. You, you're not dry you're not driving around with Chris Marsden sitting next to you, are you? <laughs> Is it a bit of a change of scenery? Yeah, no, that was a good time. Good time then. No, um, yeah, that was a good time. But God, I'm just thinking it was got to be 20 years ago. Easy, easy. What, 25? Yeah, long time. But I bet it feels like a, a different world completely because, I mean, the, the, the line of work you're in now compared to the line of work 20 years ago, they, they're, they're different sceneries. Yeah, no, they are. But I mean, ultimately, I'm still involved in the team. You're still involved in an organisational structure that you've got to adhere to. You've got um, a lot of similarities in in, in the, the job I'm doing now to to football. Other than the fact that obviously there's a far more creative aspect to the football side of it. But from a business perspective, you have to use your brain in a creative way as well. You've got it's building relationships like football. Um, and it's getting things across the line, which is exactly the same as, as as football, you know. So there are a lot of similarities. I guess. I guess usually we we kind of start these interviews and start these conversations with how did you first hear about county or how did you get into football? But I guess seeing as we're on the topic of work, it's it's, it's probably a bit bit wiser to start at the end. How did it feel when you when you made the transition? Did did you know that you had a job to go to when you stopped playing football, or or how 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 did the whole thing play out? So yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I did know that I was going into to this line of work, for however long it was going to last. But that was that certainly wasn't something I would know. But I was finishing up at uh, Hamilton, and uh, a friend of mine asked me to go up and just see how I got on. But she was fine with me. I was thirty six. We were looking to go back to Scotland anyway as as a family, so it sort of made sense. Um, so I signed for Hamilton at the same time, um, a neighbour of mine literally lives next door, who still lives next door, and we've moved and he's moved, but we're still next door, so we're still good mates. He, he worked for for the company I work for now, and he had met the owner of the business. It's a family-run business. I'd met the owner of the business when we played uh, Blackburn Rovers back in the day in the, in the Coca-Cola Cup, I think it was. And I met him after the game and we just had a brief chat, but I was still playing, obviously. And then he must have remembered the conversation and a friend of mine sort of mentioned it again, said I was retiring. So they asked me in and basically said, look, do you want, do you want the job? It's just going to be a sort of account manager role. 
see how you go. And, and if, as far as I was concerned, I had no plans of doing anything like that at all. But at the same time, I thought, well, it's an easy, it was an easy end because I was only playing for Hamilton on the traveling up on the Friday, playing on the Saturday, and then I'd basically the, the week to, to myself. So that's what I did. I started working Monday to Friday and then traveling up and playing for Hamilton on the Saturday. And it worked fine for about two or three months, but I then I had a, I had a, my cartilage in my left knee went, um, which was my bad knee, if you will, because I had, a, I had an ACL that had lasted me 16, 17 years. So I was pleased with getting through it, but it, it just felt right to stop playing. So yeah. I had... I had three months doing both, and then in the end, I just I decided to call it a day. It just seemed just seemed like the right time, and then I carried on working, and I've not stopped. I've moved, I've moved job roles, but I've stayed with the same company for the last fourteen years. Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> when when that time when when Correct. that time was impressive. I've never stayed with a company that long, but um, when 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 you were coming towards the the end, <laughs> when you were coming towards the end of the, the playing career. Um, obviously, the the first thought, I guess, or maybe a common thought that goes through a lot of players' minds is, how can I stay in the game? Yeah, punditry, yeah. Co- coaching, management, scouting, uh, yeah. ambassador roles, yeah, physios, whatever it might be. Did that did that train of thought ever go through through your mind? Yeah, of course, because you don't know anything else. You know, you, as you said before, you alluded to the fact that this most footballers have been doing this since you know five, six, seven years of age. So when you you come to the natural conclusion it is to stay in the game. Um, I had a, a two-year, two-and-a-half-year spell at Boston United, which was doing a lot of travelling, and it, I, I sort of lost I lost the love of the game, if that makes sense. It just didn't feel as if I was wanting to stay in the game. Um, so I actually came out of the game for about a year, completely just, you know, just watched on the TV, but I never, I never thought about getting back into it. But I'd already done my, uh, my my second coaching license, my B license. I'd already got that. And then a friend of mine who was also a coach at Wolves and Aston Villa, Bobby Downs, was the he was the uh, academy director at uh, Blackburn Rovers, and I live in Charlotte. It's twenty minutes down the road. Uh, so I went in and so I still do the coaching now that's 14 years on and I still do <laughs> turnovers yeah so I've been doing that only wow. part time it just sort of marries in with the with the work you know and, and the, the sort of lifestyle that you want so I've never never really wanted to do it full time because it's precarious and um, never really went down that road of putting all those eggs into that basket um I'm not sure why, to be honest, you know, because when you're you're doing the coaching like I do with the 16s now, I really enjoy it, you know. I, 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 it's good to see the lads getting something from it. Some of them have kicked on playing in the first team. Some of them have obviously gone to other places. And some of them, you know, don't <coughs> make it at all. So it's, and it's interesting to see over the years who comes through, who doesn't come through, or who you thought might have came through and obviously fell at the wayside. Um but I do enjoy it and do enjoy it still. Do you, do you think that, that 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 love for football will just always kind of propel? Like you say, it's what you've done since you were five years old. It's it's there within you. And I mean, you talk about career highs. I know you had success at other clubs as well, but obviously being the county show, we're, we're going to focus on them in particular. Such highs. I mean, there's such memorable nights and stuff. That love for football is, is probably always going to be there somewhere kicking around, isn't it? Oh yeah, it just changes. It's weird. It just changes. You, you, your thought processes change from, you know, the the anxiety sometimes going to playing into these big games that you're leading into, and the different kinds of feel, feelings that you have going into it. To now, you just have a very nice memory of them, and it's it's a nice feeling to feel uh, in a good way about these games. You don't feel as if there's no animo- no anxiety in those games. You know, sometimes it's it's it can be quite, it can be quite emotional um, playing in those games, leading up to those games, and now, fourteen, fifteen, twenty years on, obviously you just you have a you you have a very nice connection with the, with those games. But it's also important that most 
footballers go through some, you know, the bad times. I went through them myself, and I know a lot of players go through bad times. Um, but you don't remember them as much, you know. You don't remember them as much. Mm -hmm. Now, talk, talking of bad times, they're, they're obviously the, the main bad time I remember for Tom Bennett was obviously the, the leg break, and we've spoken since then. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I, I remember one night in particular where several ales had been had been <laughs> had been drunk, and um, I seem to remember you you and Roger Wild um, playing a gig down in Stockport. Now, the the, the, the bad times. We'll get onto that why that gig happened and how those gigs came about. But the bad time, which was your leg break, if I'm not mistaken, actually led to you being in a band, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It started as a laugh, really, Roger. Um, oh, I've got a little battery in my phone, so I've got it on my recording. Roger was um, was the physio at Stockport, and he wanted to, I think we always wanted to be a rock and roll star, did Roger? So, fair enough, OK. Uh, <laughs> let, let's learn to play the guitar. So that's basically what we did. We started to learn, we learned to play the guitar just for a laugh, and that sort of snowballed to let's have a goal, let's have something to aim for. Um, and so we slowly got round to getting one or two members. I think we put it in a programme at Stockport and we got two or three guys, a drummer, and we got a, you know, a, a, a guitarist, anybody that would make us look good. That was the bottom line, you know, because um, we, were, we were pretty hopeless. And we, we toyed around with, you know, different singers and stuff like that. I think I ended up being the singer. Well, I know I did end up being one of the singers which is just ridiculous to think about. But, um, yeah, we had a good time. And we've probably done it about 15 years all all in. When I think about the times and the years that we did it, you know, it was a, it was a long time. It was, it was a good time. And, um, yeah, I spoke to Roger, not, I think it was yesterday. To, not, not on the phone. I got him on WhatsApp and we were having a chat. And he wants to put the band back together. I went, Roger, you're 65. You must be 65. As if we're not the Rolling Stones, you know. <laughs> So so let me get this straight. The band Fracture, featuring Tom Bennett and Roger Wilde. We have a couple of bands who are who are doing bits and pieces in Stockport at the moment. Um, yeah. we've got the Dutch Uncles and we've got Blossoms, of course, who are who are going all over the world and doing what they're doing. Yeah. If if Fracture reunite, obviously it blows those two guys out of the water. Maybe they can support you at Edgley Park. Well, you know, I tell you what, I'd be willing to support the Blossoms at Edgley Park. That's, that's that's nailed on. If that's what they want, I won't even charge them. We'll do it for free. We wouldn't even charge them. <laughs> let me get let me get their agent on the phone. I'll do that right now. But uh, here's, a, it, here's a gig lined up for you. Sell the tickets without even just mention us on undercard fracture. Because <laughs> we just fly out the door. Uh, it, it'd be something. I'll tell you what. Uh, funnily enough, we, we mentioned your old pal Chris Marsden um, at, at the top of the show. There, we had Chris on this very same show uh, a month or so back, and he was referring to Roger wanting to be a rock star as well. Was this well known in Stockport County that Roger Wilde was a physio slash footballer slash potential, I don't know, Axel Rose maybe? Yeah, it was, it's, it's shy and retiring as Roger. Very shy and very retiring. <laughs> no, uh, he's not. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it was a natural progression, wasn't it? A natural progression for Roger to probably being a footballer to being a rock star. And he was just... He was always just finding a way to get in today, and I think he saw my leg break as, as the natural way in, and the name of the band just, yeah, let's go, well, leg break, fracture, yeah, let's do that. So, but we're not. I've, I've got to say, go on. I've got, I've got to say, he's the only physio, and I've worked in a lot of football grounds over the years, as, as you have as well. He's the only physio I've ever heard that has a staple song from the terraces that comes out every time he comes onto the pitch. I've never seen a physio like that anywhere else. No, but yeah, that, I mean, I would agree with you. And I think that's probably down to the fact that he did have a, a fantastic playing career, you know. And I think if you look at the clubs he was at, I think Sheffield Wednesday, Oldham, hmm. um, and obviously Stockport, if you look at those, those teams when he plays, I think that's where it starts from. It starts from those clubs sort of recognising who he was because he's got the hair and... And he still looks after himself. So I think it starts from there. And then before you know it, other clubs take it on, you know. And it's, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's a nice thing to see. If I was, if it was Roger, it'd be a great thing because obviously he's, he's well recognised as, as, as a player that, that done well for those clubs, you know. Let's, let's talk about your playing career then because you, you played quite well for Stockport County, I think it's fair to say. I mean, 
remembered uh, in an all-time 11 just a few weeks ago, as, as the club put it out on their social channels. You look back at your time at, at Stockport County, and that team, I mean, the 96-97 team at Stockport County, I I think will be remembered as as possibly the, the greatest team that County have ever had. It's, it's certainly currently that, and the, there's a long way to go if any team is going to beat it. Um, does it... How does it make you feel knowing that that you were a staple part of that? You were one of the first names on the team sheet every week. Tom Bennett and Chris Marsden, you two are the guys in the middle. Yeah, well, I think we, you know we were lucky. The, the manager, you look back in it, and it, it wasn't rocket science in terms of how he wanted to play. He wanted to play for <clears> but he wanted the spine of his team to be strong, and he wanted um, you know. A big lad up front, and he wanted some some legs around him. So he, the, the the difficult part, or the genius, whatever you want to call it, the lock, whatever you want to call it, a bit of all of that, I suppose, is is getting the the right players to be able to do that. And then once you get the right players, the right blend, the right mix, then you see where it takes you. And and I think those those years, certainly with, with Chris in there, we just complement each other. There was no egos in that side um, from a midfielder's point of view. Nobody tried to do it more than their job, if you will. You know, we want you know we want Maradona's. We were we were good, good players punching above the weight of the, of the level, but we knew we were better than the level or as good as the level when we went into the championship, and we 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 went under the radar a little bit, you know, because I think we were players as well that had been sort of discarded as well from bigger clubs, and I know Chris was playing. In the third team at Notts County at one point, and Aldo obviously came on from Wolves. Um, and you looked right through that team, picked up Brett from Sunderland, I think, or whatever. It's, you know, Alan from Newcastle was a kid, so Alan Armstrong. So you see that though all those players had something to prove, and I think the genius of it was that he, he put them in together left footed midfielder and Chris. I was right side, he would play similar. Um, and big Brett Angel up front was flicking on for Alan Armstrong with the legs, and and we didn't try to complicate it. We didn't try to to be better than what we thought we were. And I think momentum kept going as well. When you start getting the momentum, you're winning games, and you're winning games, you're winning games. It, 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 the momentum grows, and before you know it, you go into the park believing you're going to win every game. Well, I think we started that season. The season we went up, we were really poor. We, I think we. Were, yeah, ten points off the top at one point. You know, it was ridiculous. After about six, it's years. um, it's a common theme. What what you're saying there is a common theme. A from the, the players that we've had on the show that played in that team, and we've had a few now. Sean Connolly's been on, uh, Mike Flynn, Tony Dinning, Chris Marsden, uh, Brett Angel, Alan Armstrong. You know, the, the, they're all saying the similar things. You just kind of felt like, without wanting to sound big headed about it or, or whatever. You just knew you were going to, you just felt like you were going to win. Every game you went out there, no reason to believe you weren't going to win. And then you touched on something else that, that Brett Angel spoke about. And Brett, because Brett had been at, at County on two occasions and he knew the club well and he knew Dave Jones, but then he knew the manager previous in Danny and, and you know, the kind of thinking and thought process there. Yeah. Brett alluded to, the, to this mindset from Dave Jones and the players that he wanted players that tasted the big. The big time, if you like, the bigger clubs. The, the you mentioned Wolves there, you mentioned Everton, Newcastle, so on and so forth. Yeah. He wanted players that had tasted that, who then had left those clubs for whatever reason, but had the hunger and the talent to maybe get back. And then Dave sees them as if you can gel together, then maybe you can get that move back up there, or maybe you can take stop or there. But he wanted that kind of, and maybe maybe pedigree is the right word. You, you know, you've, you've been there and you've got that experience. And you know what? So it's a good way of looking at, and, and I don't, I don't disagree with with that at all. Because when you mention it to me, I'm thinking, well, playing in front of the crowd at Stockport didn't phase most of us at all. You know, as much as it's, yeah. you get, you get a, a great crowd at, at County on the better days, and you were still only getting ten thousand there. So you were, you were getting a fantastic atmosphere, but you want it wasn't forty thousand, thirty thousand, and if you look at Obviously, Brett playing for Everton in front of that kind of atmosphere. Uh, myself at Wolves, um, and and you you don't get phased by the crowd. So when you then go and play against you know your you Black Buns, your West Ham's, and, and and teams like that in in the cup competitions, you don't you don't get phased by it. 
because you've got mm. that experience and this is it's probably very true that he looked at players that were better than the division to get them out of the division and if you look at the the, the wolves team that he he put together when he left uh stockport and went to wolves very similar but with better players um no disrespect to the lads at stockport but we're all we all knew where we were and we all knew our limitations and i think he went back to wolves and he and he just went four four two pace down the wing two midfielders that could get stuck in and um I think it was uh, Colin Cameron and Alex Ray. So very similar, very similar sort of mm-hmm. blueprint, if you will, to to try and get that success. And and he did. He got he got Wolves into the Premier League for the first time in twenty five years, I think twenty years. So um, yeah, it, it's interesting. It's 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 a good way of looking at it. And I think Brett's probably hit it on the head. He, he got experience in that could cope with the level and and knew they were better than the level and wanted that hunger to get back. Now, as a fan through those years, I mean, it was obviously made uh, quite a bit easy with the success, but as a fan looking in, it looked like it was one of the, the most fun dressing rooms and environments that a player could be. And you see the pictures even now, you know, you start doing your research for these interviews, you go back and you find yourself looking at old pictures and videos and stuff, and it looks... Like a very very fun place. What was it like in the dressing room in those days? We had we had our times. There was some feisty times in the dressing room in terms of behind closed doors. If things weren't um, if things weren't going well, um, things were said in the dressing room. There's no two ways about it. But I think that's that's healthy. That's it's needed. You know, you can't have you can't have it all happy happy smiley people that are just happy to get on with it. You know, you you want winners, and we had that, but we mm-hmm. also had. We also had some good good times with some of the lads because we all knew that none of us were bigger than than who we were. You know, there was like I said, there was no ego. So you you know, Toddy, life and soul, and you got you got like Chrissy Marsden was there with um, Shane Nicholson was there. You had you know Kevin Cooper. You had all these lads that were all good lads. You know, and they all came in together and they all went away together and we all sort of. I had a few beers together sometimes. Some of us not, you know, because of where we lived and what have you. But it was, um, it was, it was one of the better dressing rooms, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, your old teammate Jim Jim Gannon, county manager currently, won the league a couple of years ago. Um, took county to Wembley on a successful trip to Wembley for the first time in the club's history. Uh, in another spell at the club, very highly regarded as a young manager. Very highly regarded in what he's done at county and the way that he's brought through so many young players who've gone on to play in the Premier League and the Championship and the SPL. He's 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 revered as some kind of tactical genius, I think, by, by myself and many other county fans. When you look at Jim's career, and you knew him as a player, you knew him better than anyone before, you know, social media was a thing and we could just have access yeah. to people and speak to people the way we do now. Does it surprise you in any way or, 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 or is it more expected? I don't know. When you see the success Jim has had, did did you see him as a future coach or a manager when you played alongside him? Yeah, um, yes and no. I think if you'd asked me at the time, did you see these certain players as coaches? Then he'd be one of those players that I'd go, yes, I can see it um, because of his intensity. He was very, he's a very intense man. Even you know, you get one on one and one. Jim's as nice as pie. Very, but he'll he want to talk to you. He'll want to understand things and and and. He'll go through things with you, and once he's got that understanding, then he accepts it and, and it go. When you when you get Jim in the environment of a team environment, it can be very harsh, very aggressive, um, and speaks his mind. So from that point of view, I, I saw someone who, if he went into coaching, would be very determined, very single-minded, and have a a clear idea of where he wanted to go with with, with a team. So. When I've seen him, I've seen some of his games, some of his styles he plays at Stockport and Motherwell, when he's at Motherwell and done, it, it, his team plays football. He wants to play football. You can see that. You can clearly see that, you know, from a from a, a style of play, he wants to play, um, which is sometimes very difficult to do when you go lower down. When you go lower down, it tends to be a bit old school, a bit kick and rush um but mm. 
think if you have the right players and you play the right way, you can play yourself out of any level. But you have to have the right players to do it. And um, I haven't seen enough of Stockport over the couple of years to turn around and say, you know, the, the style of play is, is, is how I'd, I'd, I'd like it to be. But certainly... I know Jim's style over the years, and I know he's highly regarded uh, in, in Scotland when he was there uh, in terms of how he wanted to play and how he did set up his teams. So um, looking back, did I think he would go into coaching? I wouldn't say anybody would have went into coaching. Some, some, some stand out. Jim didn't stand out, but at the same time, I can see why he's done well because of his single-mindedness. Now, there's, I'm, I'm keeping one eye on the clock. Say again? Did that answer your question? It did, it did in great detail, Tom. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I'm keeping one eye on the clock, and I'm conscious that I said, oh, it's just a 20-minute chat, and we've, we've strayed over already. But there's two games, Probably. before I let you go tonight, Tom, there's two games in particular that I want to speak to you about. Um, there's one game in particular uh, that was Chesterfield away, and it was just the pinnacle on that season. You know, the, the promotion comes in, the celebrations around the pitch. We go 1-0 up and then Paul Jones has to make a number of saves and we held on to that win and, and it's and football's come home, if you like. Um, yeah. If you can just recall any memories from that afternoon slash evening um, slash maybe late, early hours of the morning, maybe. But what was it like being a player for Stockport County on that day? Well, it was weird because it was a culmination of that whole season, wasn't it? And it was, it was a there was a feeling of inevitability coming into it. I was, it is a very memorable game for me for, for a number of reasons. One, it was the second last game of the season, and we if we won, we were up. If we didn't win, we'd gone into the last game of the season, which was against Luton away, and it was between us and Luton to then go up. So it was, it was a huge. There was more than just that game on it. You know, it was weird. It was. It was. We always knew that was a a, a a big, big game, if you will. And it was. A, I might be wrong with the day, but I, I, in my head, it was a wet Tuesday night. You know, a wet Tuesday night in Chesterfield, and Brett scored. I, I don't. I can't even tell you. Was it fifteen minutes in? It was. I know it was in the first half, and he scored. And I knew it was a header. Mm-hmm. You know? Quite early on, yeah. Quite early on, and once that goal goes in, it settled everybody. But then it didn't. It then became more nervous and more nervous and more nervous. And I actually twisted my ankle about I don't know ten, fifteen minutes before the end, maybe. And I had to come off. I literally couldn't go on. And I came off. And normally, sometimes when you come off, you because it's pressure, it's building up and what have you. Normally, when you come off, you go, "Well, that's me. I've done my job. I can't do any more." But the pressure just stayed. It stayed there because you're, you're sitting there watching this game unfold. You can't do anything about it in the last five, ten minutes. And then I remember, well, and again, I might be wrong in this. It felt like there was about 15 minutes injury time. In reality, <laughs> it was probably in reality there was probably about five or six. There was, but there was a huge amount of injuries. I always remember that. And I don't think it was because of my ankle. I was only off a couple of minutes. But um, and then the final whistle goes, and it's. Yeah, we're well, there. Yeah, you know, we've done it. Um, the ankle's better. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, listen, I did play against Luton on the Saturday, strapped up. I, I, it was painful, but uh, yeah, I did play. But um, relief, probably as much as anything. You know, I think probably most players would say, you know, after that season and what we'd achieved, that just for that single season, when you look back on your career, you go, wow, you know, that was. That was 65 games of, you know, a lot of ups, a lot of ups and not many downs, you know. And really... Sean Connolly. Should have won the league. Oh, of course. Well. Of course. Yeah, we should have won the league. Sure, Sean Connolly was one of the uh, the first guests we had on, on this um, feature through the summer. And I asked him about yeah. that game. And he said his biggest, one of his biggest regrets in football was that he didn't go on the team coach home that night. He got a he got a lift home with one of the other lads. They stopped to have a quiet pint somewhere on the way back, and that that was it. And he says yeah. he just so 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 for the story Sean couldn't tell us. What, what I, do you I, remember I, from I, that? Yeah, we'll try it I, honestly, I can't remember. I can't remember. It's, there is a, there's there's definitely a couple of beers drunk, but there's also um, 
again, it comes with experience. You've got to remember that some of the players were young, but most of the players were experienced players. And I think there's a huge amount of relief involved. There's a huge amount of satisfaction as well and quiet contemplation, maybe, you know, that, that you know, we want, we want rock and roll stars. We're not, we want a group of players that just wanted to go and smash up a, a nightclub or do anything like that. We were, you know, if you, well, you look at Jim, Jim you know, Gannon now as a, as Jim Gannon as a player, you know, he's methodical, he's, you know, he's single-minded and he's, he's the same way as he was when he played. And, you know, Flenny was the same, you know, experienced players, Brett Angel, experienced. So the younger lads, we're having a few beers at the back of the bus, but most of us were just, you know, just pleased, I suppose, with a job well done. Um, so I couldn't, I'd love to turn around and say there was a lot of rock and roll going on and what have you, but there wasn't. You're not, you're not a team of Roger Wilds, are you? You're not, <laughs> you're not throwing TVs off the coach Roger or anything. Been, Roger would have been asleep anyway, it would been way past his bed. <laughs> Um, the the other game I've got to ask you, and this I mean we could go on all night, and I could ask you about the Southampton game and the Blackburn game, and you know Everton and this and that and, and everything else. But the game I want to ask you about is a Port Vale game because you scored a goal in front of the Cheedland that was recently, you know, there's, there's fan polls all the time. We have now Twitter and Facebook and everything else, and one of the greatest team goals that Stockport County have ever scored was put in the back of the net by Tom Bennett where Kevin Cooper has won the ball back from a Mike Flynn clearance. He's knocked it to Alan Armstrong, who's done a nice little one-two off Tom Bennett through Brett Angel. Um, still, the ball's come down the left-hand side. He's coming in a nice little turn. Tom Bennett stuck it in the corner. We're going back a little while, but it is such a memorable classic goal. Do you recall it at all? You're looking at me like maybe you don't. I do know, I do know the goal. I do know the goal, and I do know it was both one of the best goals, team goals scored for, for Stockport. Um, and I didn't score many goals as you know my career will play out. I didn't score many goals at all in my career, but um, I do remember, I do remember the goal. But I wouldn't say at the time it was something that I thought as would be an iconic goal, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Purely because I just had the last little bit, if that makes sense. It's not until you look back at it and you go, "Wow, what a, you know, what a well what goal!" And, and testament to us, probably as a side at that time, that we could produce that kind of goal. The fact that I was at the other end to, to finish it off is great for me. But in terms of the actual goal itself, it's is quite it's quite nice to see that from a from a team perspective, from our team perspective, to be able to produce something like that at that level. Um, mm -hmm. you know, because ultimately it is all about levels. You know, we could all score the one the goal in the Sunday league and, and you know on the, on the park pitches, but to to play at all a of good us. level. Well, you know, most of us. <laughs> uh, I, do, I have a moment at Power League every now and again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you do you, you know you can you can score good goals anywhere, but to score it in that sort of setting and, and know that it's recognised for what it is and what it was, yeah. which was a great team goal. Um, that's that's nice to be recognised. But in terms, from my point of view, from a memory, it, it's it's a goal I scored rather than what a great goal that was to to replay, mm. you know, and, and, and go over. Um, which, right or wrong, is just the way it is. You know, I think I scored a goal against Blackpool, which... For all it was, in my view, personally, I felt that was my best goal ever. Even though it wouldn't even recognise on a on a Stockport County fan board, if that makes sense. It was just mm. how it felt at the time when it came to me, what I did, and how it ended up in the back of the net. And you go, for me, that was personally, you know, a great goal. But that's only from my perception. The perception from a fan's point of view is the the the, the team, which is right, which is right, and yeah. and, and it's it should be well just just finally tom let me let, let me leave you on on this question when when someone says stop or county to you now what 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 memories what what kind of feeling do you get inside because you, you're well traveled in the game of football you've got a lot of experience under your belt but stop or county what does it mean to you when you hear it oh god you can't i, I couldn't sum that up in a, in a in a sense really you know what i mean i had a fun, i was there five years in truth, I had four fantastic years. And then I could break that four down 
and, and not just football, you know, because of the break of the leg. But in that break, the, there's something else occurred with the, with the with the relationship and the friendship I, I got with, you know, with Roger and the band and other people that from the from the ground that I actually got involved with. So I had a year where it wasn't really about football for me; it was about something else. Um, mm. And then you've got the the actual games that you played in, the, the, you know, the, playing in the championship, the first time against City. You've got you've got so much built into that five years that you couldn't. I couldn't just go what. what Oh, what a fantastic experience! That'd be the easiest thing to say, you know. It was a, it was a fantastic experience, but that would, in some ways, for me, in terms of the memories that I have, doesn't do it justice. It doesn't do, it doesn't do the that time that time frame for for a lot of people, you know, a lot of Stockport fans. It doesn't do that time frame justice. Um, for me, when playing against Wolves, you know, kept being the captain at Esley Park against Wolves, it's. Memory after memory after memory after memory it would stay with you. You know, I don't have, I yeah. don't have to really go back into the memory banks to, 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 to bring them forward. They're all, they're always there. They're always at the front. And if someone jogs my memory, i.e. Port Vale goal, then it's, it's there. It takes a little time, but most of the time, I can tell you something about each of the years. You know, and each of the some things that happened and some things that we did, and um, yeah, so. I couldn't do it justice by summing it up for one sentence, but it was a great time in my life, you know, um, that's for sure. And when the corona's gone, can we get you down for a game, Tom? Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> I, keep, I keep getting asked to go down, and because of work and because of Blackburn, because the, the biggest problem for me is we're, we're working at Blackburn with, on, is on a Saturday. So um, it's, yeah. it's, always, it's always been difficult, you know, um, with work. But at the same time, sometimes we'll play... Um, you know, we might have Manchester United at Carrington in the morning, so that would be a good time if I could tie up at Hesley Park in the afternoon, that would work well. That'd be an absolute dream. Tom, it's been such an honour to have you on tonight, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can get to get to see you at one of those games in the near future. Yeah, no problem, Chris. Appreciate it. Thanks for the call. Well, you, you were right about that, Chris. He is Mr Cool. He's Joe Cool on campus. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to say, you know, I'd like to look as good at, uh, at his age, but I'm actually probably older, so <laughs> I can't say that. But yeah, what a I lovely wish, guy. I wish I, I wish I looked that good now. Yeah. I wish I looked that good now. Absolutely. We're approaching man crush territory. Yeah, I think so. I, I, think, I mean, I didn't have the um, I didn't have the stones to tell him, but um, many, many moons ago, um, when we were filming for the Music Factor, uh, Roger Wilde and Tom Bennett played at the Bungalow. And um, one of the bands that were on after them um, said, oh, Rid Ridgeway, Chris Ridgeway plays guitar, get him on stage. So Roger Wilde insisted that I came and joined them and we did a cover of Don't Look Back in Anger. And I, I just came away thinking, I was too drunk for the evening, really. I shouldn't have been on there. But I, I couldn't help but think Tom Bennett wasn't happy that I'd, <laughs> I came grand the set. But, um, yeah, no, a lovely fella. And, um, yeah, was, like it like, was it like that bit in um, Back to the Future when he plays a guitar, but then he starts to fade away because the photo's fading and he starts playing it really badly? Was it like that? Um, it, if, if he was playing it badly, then yes. Exactly <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, but, um, what, but, you know, in all seriousness, cool guy, but what a great player. And, and as we said before, part of, you know, an absolutely seminal, an absolutely key midfield for Stockport County. Yeah. And um, I always love hearing the perspective of players like Tom because he was there on that famous night in Chesterfield when they've, you know, when they've won promotion. They know that this is going down in history, right? This is, this is... I mean, here we are, what, 20 odd years later, and we're still talking about it. And, and in another 20 years, we're probably still going to be talking about it. It's, it's that kind of night. So it's always good to hear how how the players reacted that night. And, and it was interesting to hear him say that they, you know, they were calm about it because it was job done. That, you know, all right, they're having a few beers and, and, and whatever, but it's they, they just felt accomplished more than anything else. Like they, they believed in themselves, whatever. It, it still still a little bit bitter in him that they, they didn't get to the league title because they were good enough to win the league. But with the cup runs uh, and everything else, it was just too many games. Um, but, you know, it, 
listen, it's a, it's a great story. And then, and then obviously the the other part, which is tinged with a bit of sadness, I guess, is um, hearing about how you know he's another player like Liam Dickinson the other week who has the world at his feet. He's going places, and then this horrible injury just comes in, and he's all of a sudden got this this monster leg break to deal with. Um, and and you know the, how the how the mental side of that was affected, and then how Roger Wilde, again county legend, has helped him out by telling him to pick up the guitar, and then again twenty years later they're in a band together. It's it's madness, and it's interesting, and it's it's just fascinating. It's an insight into into a professional footballer's life that goes beyond the ninety minutes of kicking a ball around and and all right, you do it well, but there is so many more layers to you. Uh, and that's right. And that's what I think that's what this whole summer, this whole thing for us has shown that, you know, we've had player after player after player, but they've all got a different perspective. Everybody, you know, has been to other clubs. Everybody's had a different experience. Everybody's career has ended in a different way. Um, but they all they all love the club and they've all had a different experience. So it's it's been great to hear from Tom as well. Yeah, that silky Scottish accent. Do you know what? Hear me out. Hear me out. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Tom Bennett for James Bond. <laughs> well, my, I, I, you know, you go back to the original, to the original. Yeah. Yeah. You know, go back to the well, Scottish yeah. James Bond, you know. Yeah. I, was, his, I, I, was he not I, 90 the other day? Um, Sean Connery. But yeah, I think the best ever James Bond um, was Piers Brosnan. And he's Irish. So it takes an Irishman to be the greatest James Bond. Well, don't Listen, at me. You, you and I, you and I aren't going to get the role, so it's got to go to somebody. So why not put Tom Bennett forward? And do you know what? He's he, he's offered his services to support Blossoms at Edgeley Park, which is good of him. Um, why not get him double bill? James Bond, Die Another Day, or whatever the next film is going to be called. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you know. With all your contacts, you'd be a great agent. <laughs> travel travel agent we um <laughs> but on on that note talking of uh edgeley park um the, the influx of place uh keep keeps happening they, they keep you know the, the owners are true to their word they're giving um jim not you wouldn't say free reign but they're giving him an open market to to go to and have a look and and find the players that he wants and it's so interesting now we were just discussing before we came came live that you could put a almost an 11 from last season against a new 11 on the pitch with 22 players to be a really interesting training match yeah yeah you, you you're not far from it i think i think obviously the, the two new left backs uh, two new left backs indicates that you know there's that, that that was a bit of a problem area last season um and the number 10 role has obviously been vacated by um by Elliot Osborne uh, and James uh, and Connor Jennings has come in. So other than that, yeah, you, I mean, you, you could stick with the same sort of eight or nine other players, or you could just completely kibosh that and 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 go with a whole new string. It's it's unbelievable, really. But um, county fans, us included, have been saying for years. If somebody comes along and buys this club and, you know, they've got a bit of backing and they've got a bit of business sense and blah, 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 then they could turn it into a, into a great thing because it really is a sleeping giant. And now we are seeing that play out. We are seeing it happen. Um, I think it's it's so good that somebody has come in and just do, and done this because they've – we could have had a takeover where someone's come in and – just kept things going on and that'd be fine. And listen, we wouldn't have complained. We, we'd, we'd have chugged along and, you know, with Jim at the wheel, I think we would have got out of non-league football this season or next, you know, it would have carried on going and we would have had exciting players. But someone has come in and gone, nah, next level time. Do you know? And I think the, you, you look at, yeah, the influx of players, but then look at the new training ground. Then look at the stuff in the community. Then look at... Um, you know, the, the, like the NHS donation and all this. Then look at the new kits, the sponsors. Everything that's that's, that's coming along is is next level stuff. It really is. Yeah, and just to say, there's a friendly on Saturday uh, against Colin, so that might be an opportunity to see um, eleven and because uh, to see eleven and another eleven at half time. It, yeah, 
that's quite common in fret in, in friendlies probably not 11 for 11 but the chances of seeing a lot of players on the pitch on saturday are, are quite high well it has it has been the theme of jim gannon's um pre-season if that's what you want to call it um you know the the 11 on and 11 off at half time we have seen wholesale changes and i don't know i think as we edge towards the season getting closer i would imagine these friendlies we're going to see less and less of that i've not spoken to jim um, if I'm completely honest about uh, which is which is his preferred eleven, which players are going to stay? Are there any? You would imagine some are going to go out on loan at the very least, um, but you'd have to take a broad assumption that these first half teams are his chosen eleven. I mean, that would make the most sense, um, and he can get a good grasp of how they feel. They can play, you know, 45 minutes together against usually good opposition. To be fair to Colm, you know, they're, they're probably not a bad side, but. I don't think they'll be fancying the chances against Stockport County. Whereas in recent weeks, teams like Rochdale and, and Fleetwood, who are higher up in the pyramid, you know, they're higher level opposition. And County have stepped up and, and matched and they've not got all the wins, but they've got a good win against Salford. So I think it's going to be interesting to see, yes, over the preseason, how these players bed together, but also how many changes he makes. Because as we get closer to the season kicking off in October, you would imagine the changes mid-game will become less and less and we can start to hone in on just exactly what that 11 is going to look like because, as you touched on a moment ago, mate, there are so many players for only 11 positions. And I don't want to throw the cat amongst the pigeons. Danny Lloyd has just been released by Salford or he's just left <laughs> open by mutual consent. I don't... I, listen, I have no zero in, um, insight I can't imagine it happening, if I'm honest. I think we are so full at the moment with players. But in this day and age, you wouldn't rule it out, would you? No, absolutely. And there's a fella I've heard called Lionel Messi who's a, who might be available as well. So <laughs> you'd only have to, Is it £436 million you have to pay the Spanish League to, that, to, get, to release his... How, ma- how many clubs do you reckon you could buy for £436 million? Never mind players. Could probably buy the whole of... Of Championship Two and the whole of the National League for four hundred and thirty-six million. Championship Two, <laughs> yeah, or whatever it's called, League Two, <laughs> League Pre- Two, Pre- Premier League Two, Super <laughs> Barclays, <laughs> well, Scottish whiskey. I don't know what what it's called these days. <laughs> no, you, it, it's me. It's, it's obscene. It's bonkers. It is. It has. Bonkers. It has the potential. It has the potential to be the footballing story of our lifetime. It really does. I mean, you know, you think back to generations previous. Where it's, that's a little, that's a little bit strong. It's massive. It, well, you know, so who, whoever he, so either he stay. So if he goes to City, you think that's a bigger story than say Leicester winning the league? Yeah, I do. No, don't listen. Don't get me wrong. Leicester winning the league was great for football and all the rest of it. But when you've got the best player, I'm going to stick my neck out and say the best player of all time moving for what will almost certainly be over double the record transfer fee ever spent. I mean, you talk, like you said, 440 million or whatever it was, that'll just be the tip. Think of all the fees that go on around it. You're talking well over 500 million. Yeah. Um, that is an, yeah, I think, I'm not saying it's a good news story for football, but is it the biggest? It's, it's seismic. It's massive. It, it's definitely seismic. Um, seismic. <laughs> well, <laughs> seismic. Seismic means shaking the ground, you know. Like, but uh, yeah, it would be. It would be ground shaking. It certainly would be. But his dad's. His dad's there in Barcelona, isn't he? His dad wants him to stay for another two years. Apparently, I've read. Who's so. allowed to play? Hey, you're frozen. Every, every day of the week, you would rather play for Barcelona than Man City. Yeah, but you could understand, you know, him wanting just to do something a little bit different. But you could also understand him, you know, they're at rock bottom at now to be the person who drug, drags them up by their bootstraps. Him and Ronald Koeman and Jeannie Wild- Wijnaldum. Making Is that new- Jeannie Wijnaldum, I fair? I, I, uh, Koeman, I'll tell you one thing. I watch quite a lot of, I don't watch a lot of international football, but I've watched Holland quite a lot because obviously Genie plays and Van Dyke plays and stuff like that. And 
Wijnaldum is so good for Holland. You can understand why Koeman loves him. He builds a Holland, Holland team around him and you can understand why he wants him. And obviously he's a free agent next year. So there's a lot of reasons why that could happen. Um, and, you know, Liverpool have had Alisson and Van Dijk to deal with in terms of super contracts because they'll, they'll, they are having their contracts renegotiated at the moment. So that's a lot of money they'll be spending. So if he's, if you're Gini Wijnaldum, you're going to be saying, well, why can't I have that money? And, you know, if, you know, if Alcan, if Alcantara is, is in the mix, then you can sit, there are a lot of pieces that jigsaw that you can see fitting together to make that happen. But then, Imagine being the player that moves to Barcelona to fill the number 10 shirt vacated by Lionel Messi. Impossible. Yeah. It's impossible. Absolutely, it's absolutely impossible. And people would have to, People definitely have to, um, you know, take take that into consideration as the team's being rebuilt. But you know, I tell you, you, what, I tell you what, that's that Barcelona fan base is um, is a tougher one to deal with than than the lads over the Albert after a, uh, <laughs> a great kick off at County. They wow. are brutal over there. They are ruthless. I don't yeah, think they, they would. Have had well, they've got their it. own. They've got their their own daily newspaper, Barcelona. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's a different different kettle of fish over there. But let's keep an eye on the biggest story ever to hit football. After Stockport County being taken over by Mark Stock. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I think that's been quite an interesting little chat at. Good to see you, mate. That's been Stockport County. Finger guns. <laughs>